Hi, Will Hughes back again. Um, this is the fourth video in the series on construction procurement, where we look at distinctive characteristics. In other words, what is it that distinguishes one procurement approach from another? So <clears throat> we've looked at some of the general procurement methods, general contracting, which has a variant of management contracting where all the work is subcontracted. Um, we've looked at design build where the contractor takes responsibility for design and we've looked at construction management where there is no general. Um, in addition to those basic methods, there's also a bunch of methods that you could group together as design, build, finance and operate. Um, that includes build, own, operate, transfer, sometimes known as boot. Um, also, the UK's private finance initiative that no longer exists um, would fall into that category. <clears throat> and those are all systems where the client, usually in the public sector, does not have to put the money up, up front. Up front. Um, instead, the banks would fund the development and then the um, public sector client would pay rent or the user would pay rent um, to the operator who would that way be able to repay the loan to the bank. Um, engineer, procure and construct. It's, you might come across in the oil and gas industry, um, but not in the building and civil engineering so much. Um, it used to mean a system where the contractor would get hold of the finance as well as um, doing the design and the construction and then um, the client would pay for the whole thing in a lump sum at the end. It's kind of turnkey contract. <clears throat> These days, the EPC contractors don't take on that much risk. Um, unlike the other procurement methods, they would be paid monthly for work in progress rather than being paid when they'd finished. And therefore, they wouldn't have to raise the finance to fund the project. So EPC now means something different to what it meant, say, 20 years ago. And performance-based contracting um, covers situations where you buy something based upon what it does and how much it's worth um, in relation to what it does. <clears throat> Whereas generally construction you pay for based upon what it's made of um, by paying for labour and materials as listed in a bill of quantities or specifications or some other document. So performance-based contracting is what you have in any other industry, really, because people who make things tend to also design them and sell them to you after they've made them. So they take care of the funding, the design, the supply chain, everything. Um, so if you buy a car or a motorcycle or a computer or something like that, um, it's essentially a performance-based contract. There are other kinds of performance-based contract, such as renting a house, renting offices, renting any kind of property, um, even staying in a hotel room. Um, those are buildings, but they're paid for based upon their value and based upon their function, not based upon the construction work input. So performance-based contracting occurs in most industries and in a lot of cases in the construction industry as well. But for some reason, construction people don't talk about it. Um, um, because they don't characterize it as if it was a procurement method. So all of those things tend to be characterized by the roles of the main parties. What is the responsibility for the contractor and the consultants and so forth? And in addition to those, there's things like um, collaborative approaches to procurement, like partnering, alliancing and frameworks, where we set up an agreement with suppliers to work together under a, an arrangement where they will be repeatedly called upon to work onto this arrangement rather than us going to competitive tendering every time we want to do some work. Um, so that covers a variety of issues which are largely to do with setting up long-term working relationships and the idea of using those in collaborative methods is to put more emphasis on the continuing relationship rather than on the letter of the contract and um, the consequent adversarial issues that arise when we focus exclusively on contractual issues. So, in terms of the distinctiveness of these, general contracting is 
characterised by the separation of design from construction and by the involvement of a general in the process. Design build also has a general but they're responsible for design as well as construction and in construction management there is no general. So the distinctions between those are all based around the role of the general contractor or the presence or absence of a general contractor. In partnering and frameworks the focus there really isn't about the kind of uh, role of the contractor is to do with the method used to select the contractor. In the private finance initiative and DBFO and so forth, the focus is on the method of funding. Um, and in engineer, procure and construct, also integrated project delivery or integrated project insurance, um, the idea is to provide a turnkey approach where the whole thing is taken care of onto one agreement that ties together all of the contributors in the supply chain. And performance-based contracting is either a lease or an outright purchase for value-based goods. So when you're thinking about these, it's important to think about where the designer and the builder sit in relation to each other, um, because it is problematic that when, when design is not being carried out by the people who are making things. Now on this slide, um, I'm just exploring an idea from transaction cost economics, which is the make or buy decision. This area of economics um, helps us to understand the boundaries to any particular firm and even why there are firms. And transaction cost economics is focused upon thinking about whether it's cheaper to go for a market transaction and buy things that your firm needs in order to achieve its aim or whether it's cheaper to actually make them in-house by employing people and owning the production means, the, the resources, the means of production. And so the difference between those is the basis of transaction cost analysis. Now, it's not a suggestion that companies actually calculate the cost of the transaction versus the cost of doing things in-house. Um, rather, it's to do with the fact that one way or the other would be more competitive and therefore the companies who are doing it the less competitive less competitive way will not survive in the marketplace so it's to do with the so-called invisible hand of the market that would favor the companies who are running these things in the most economical way and it's based upon the assumption that the costs of production are the same in both cases whether you do it by going to the market or whether you do it in-house which is a challengeable assumption in construction for reasons that will become clear when you consider the, when you consider why there are subcontractors in construction. An issue for another day. Anyway, in this slide, what I'm saying is that if we go to the market at the point where we're thinking about the business case and we want a company to come and help us with the business case and take us through the whole process, then we would end up in a DBFO or performance-based contracting situation. But if we bring the resources in-house, even if it's consultants, and we develop our own business case and then go to the market with the idea that we want a firm to take us from the feasibility stage and the concept design all the way through to conclusion, then we would be going into IPD, IPI, EPC, or management contracting. If we do that part, with our own people and then go to the market, it would take us through um, build and operate transfer or DBFO. No, sorry, not DBFO. Um, a build and operate transfer or a design build kind of a situation where we're asking the design build contractor to do their design work. But if we have a commission our own design team and have the design done and then go to the market with the idea that the contractor will complete the detailed design, then we'd be going into a design build um, variant known as novated design build which actually accounts for a considerable quantity of the work that's procured in construction in the UK these days. By far the majority is done through this so-called novated design build route where we take a partial design to the market and ask the contractor to finish it off. It's called novated because we transfer the design team that we've employed into the contractor's employment setting up new contracts um, thus novated. 
But if we finish the design with our own team and then go to the market for construction, we'd be going into general contracting or construction management. And if we actually have taken care of all of that and go to the market for operating the building, security and IT and so forth, it would be facilities management. So this just shows that <clears throat> you would decide a procurement method almost by default simply by virtue of the fact that you've chosen to go to the market at a particular point in the process. So just to summarize how these procurement methods differ, general contracting differs from design build on the basis of who has liability for design, responsibility for design, whereas those differ from construction management based upon responsibility for site coordination. <clears throat> Pardon me. Those differ from PFI and DBF, DBFO based upon where the money is coming from, and they all differ from performance-based contracting on the basis of how the price is being calculated. All of those differ from partnering on the basis of how you're selecting the people with whom you're working, and they all differ from collaborative contracting, integrated project delivery and so forth, based upon how the supply chain is being managed and coordinated. So that gives us a simple set of six issues to be considered, which we will be turning to in the next video in this series. So that's it for now. I'll see you in the next one. Cheerio.